Welcome to the Course One podcast. In this podcast, we explore the emerging open financial system. We dive into scalability, interoperability, proof of stake, blockchains, and many other parts of this coming financial singularity. Tune in every Monday to dive deep into these cutting edge projects and protocols with Course One team members and guests. So, hi, and welcome to the Course One podcast. I'm here with Mark. Olszewski. He is one of the co-founder of Cello, and we're going to dive into Cello today. But just before a few words about Course One, as you probably know, we're running validators on a variety of proof of stake networks. We're producing lots of content, doing lots of work around these networks. So if you want to learn more, just go to our website, check out that. Or if you want to stake with us, of course, you can do so at the moment on three networks, which is Loom, Terra, and Cosmos, but more are coming live soon. So with that, let's go to our conversation with Mark. So I got interested in speaking with Mark. First of all, I heard good things about Cello a bunch of times. I checked it out. I thought it was an interesting approach. But in particular, I was also interested in diving into their ideas around proof of stake incentives, economics, and the sort of validator economics I think this is a super interesting area where nobody knows what they're doing and everybody does these experiments to see how they turn out. And Cello's doing, I think, a very interesting one and a different one from what I'd seen before. So I look forward to talking about that. So thanks so much for joining us today, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Brian. It's really great to be here. So maybe let's start here. Like, Can you give us a little bit of background about who you are, how you got into the crypto space, and what's the genesis story of Cello? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm a computer scientist by background. I did my undergrad at the University of Toronto, and then I went to MIT for my PhD. During my PhD, I was working in the distributed system space and a little bit in the parallel system space, working on an area that we helped first write about uh, called deterministic multi-threading, which turns out is somewhat interesting and relevant for scaling blockchains today. And it was at MIT where I met Rene, who's our CEO today. Uh, and Rene and I actually started a company uh, out of MIT, out of a class taught by Tim Berners-Lee that was focused on the original Web3. A few people know this, but before we use Web3 for decentralized web, the term was used to mean the semantic web, which was an effort by Tim Berners-Lee around doing to data what he did to documents, namely make them open and interconnected and accessible to all. And so we started a data company using kind of the original Web3 technology called Loku. That company did well. It was focused on using data to help small businesses better compete against the McDonald's and the Amazons of the world. It got acquired. And then, you know, after that, we regrouped and we teamed up with one of our advisors and board members from Loku, Sepp Kamvar, who's a uh, very successful serial entrepreneur and also one of the inventors of Eigentrust. And we decided to, to start thinking about a new effort. And we wanted to do something big, something really mission focused. And the more we looked at kind of the problem of financial inclusion, the more we realized that, that this was something that the timing was just perfect to tackle. And so in 2017, early 2017, we started working on Cello together. And so you mentioned financial inclusions. I guess that's the mission of Cello. How what does the platform look like in order to achieve that mission? You know, to really be able to move the needle for the 1.7 billion people who are unbanked today and the 1.1 billion people who don't have access to government-recognized IDs, we knew early on that we had to build in a mobile-first manner. The 6 billion smartphones that will be connected next year in 2020. And so that was just the obvious platform for us to really have impact on our mission. And in order to do that well, we learned early on that we had to build in a full-stack manner. It wasn't enough just to build a great mobile experience on top of an existing platform. We tried that. It was hard to get to kind of the user experiences that people expected. And at the same time, we also felt that it wasn't enough just to build a new permissionless platform and expect others to build great mobile experiences on top of that. We felt that unless you were building the two hand in hand, you would probably make compromises at the platform layer that would make it hard to achieve a really great user experience on the mobile side. And so we built the two side by side. That's super interesting. So what are some of the things that you guys did on the platform level that will then enable that great mobile user experience? Lots of things. Uh, So I think first and foremost, we built a lightweight identity protocol that maps hashes of phone numbers to public keys. 
So this, in effect, is a decentralized PKI, which makes it really easy for users to find each other by phone number and then communicate and ultimately transact securely. And so we learned early on that using public key base addresses was just a non-starter for our target demographic. People expect it to be able to send payments to phone numbers. And so we wanted to support that user experience. Secondly, we built our own stability protocol right into the platform. And so Celo has actually a platform for creating multiple stable assets that are all backed by the same over-collateralized crypto asset reserve. You can think of it as an algorithm that is a hybrid between what Maker does today and what Basis was looking to accomplish back in the day. And I think most crucially... The platform also supports paying for gas with arbitrary ERC-20-like tokens so that if you're sending one of these stable coins, you can actually pay for that transaction fee in that stable coin. And so this makes the experience of sending stable value assets just so much easier. You know, the status quo today is that you have to have another, you know, typically volatile asset to pay for that transaction fee. And we want to remove that friction because it's a very unintuitive user experience for people. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think these are some of the issues that people have on Ethereum today. Where's the project at today? What has been built? And maybe also mention, I think you guys have some interesting pilots going on. Can you share a little bit about those? Absolutely. Yeah, so we've been working hard for over two years now. The team is 40-something people and a balloon to 60 people for the summer when we had our interns. And we've been working really hard to get to launch later this year or early next year. And earlier this summer, we launched our public testnet and open sourced all of the source code. And so if you go to github.com slash cello dash org, you can see our GitHub repo. And if you go to just cello.org, you'll find links to our testnet. And so you can already start playing around with the protocol. You can install our alpha version of the mobile app for Android. And you can also validate the chain and even run a full node. And we'll talk about later how you can also earn some crypto assets by running full nodes. And so all of this is live in, in this public testnet today. And we've been running a number of pilots on private test nets uh, since last November. So we've run pilots in two universities in Buenos Aires and Argentina. We've had users buy uh, their lunch with the mobile application and a bunch of merchants on board who were accepting Celo. This was also an interesting opportunity to test out the ability for people to simply uh, get access to stable value assets in Argentina. There's a lot of inflation, and so a lot of people were just interested in having access to cello dollars as well as a means of saving. And then we've also partnered with folks like uh, the UN World Food Program and Give Directly. There's a lot of humanitarian aid organizations that are interested in moving to using crypto for paying for cash transfers. And so we've been working with them on pilots around testing exactly what that experience looks like. Okay, great. Now, let's dive in a little bit, maybe when it comes to the economics of it, right? So... There is Celo Dollars, right, which is a stable coin you mentioned. Then there's also Celo Gold. What are the roles of Celo Dollar and Celo Gold in the systems, and how do the two interact with each other? Celo Gold is our native currency, and it's a deflationary currency similar to Bitcoin with a max supply. And it has a number of purposes. It is used as a reserve asset that, in part, backs the stable coins. It's used for securing the network, so you can use it to stake and kind of elect validators to uh, secure the network. And you can also optionally pay for gas. If you want to maybe send sell gold transactions, you can use it for paying for gas. And so it has these multiple uses that I think makes it somewhat new and interesting in the space. It's not just a staking asset. While Celo yeah. Dollars is kind of the first stable coin that we're launching with, the protocol really allows for a family of different stable assets that are all backed by the same reserve, which again holds Celo Gold in part. And so we envision either at launch or, or shortly after launch having actually a family of these stable coins. So not just Celo Dollars, but likely a Celo Euro and a Celo Peso and you know, maybe a Celo Shilling, a whole bunch of interesting assets. 
And the stable protocol that keeps these assets pegged to the local fiat uh, equivalents uses a Uniswap style exchange, which uh, actually means that you can also exchange between these stable assets and sell a gold without a counterparty, just using Uniswap on chain in a fully decentralized way. Uh, which also means that you can go from any of these assets to any of the other ones in a fully decentralized and permissionless way as well. So you could go from kind of the euro to the dollar without having to find a counterparty. So let's talk a little bit about the validators. What is the role of validators in the Seller network and how are validators selected? Yeah, so Seller uses a a BFT-based proof of stake protocol that has some similarities to Cosmos and Tendermint, but differs in in a number of interesting ways. I think number one, it's built with like clients in mind. And so we worked really hard to create a very lightweight algorithm for having mobile phones easily sync with the network. And I can get into some of those details later. Number two, it has a number of new and interesting, I would say, innovations on top of what has been explored today. And so one of these things is because Celo has a stable coin, I can actually pay validators a fixed fee, which is set to cover their costs, plus provide a healthy margin. And the reason that this is interesting is because since most crypto assets are volatile, there's oftentimes the risk that if there's a down market of some kind, the rewards that validators are receiving may start to shrink which can impact the security of the network. And so we wanted this baseline security that was guaranteed for the protocol by paying validators a fixed fee. This also, I think, addresses some of the issues that you guys have been talking about on your podcast around this race to the bottom around commission and having validators compete on commission and and having that go to zero, which ultimately can favor uh, centralization. And so in Celo, there is a guaranteed floor for what every validator can make, and it's guaranteed in a stable asset currency so that they're always certain they can cover their costs and achieve, again, a healthy profit margin. Now, on top of that, validators can self-stake, and they can get additional staking rewards as well. And that comes in the native currency Celo Gold. Yeah, so basically, if validators have some of their own assets, they can stake those, and they can earn some Celo Gold, basically staking asset. But just for running the validator service, they basically get paid in Celo dollars. Where do those Celo dollars come from? So Celo Gold does have a reward schedule. We have the concept of epoch rewards, where at the end of each epoch, there's a number of rewards that get issued and paid out to the contributors, to the volunteers who are helping kind of operate and run the network. And since we have the price of, of Celo Gold on chain, for the stability mechanism, we could either pay these validators a fee in Celo Gold that is fixed in terms of US dollars or denominated in US dollars, or we can simply put that gold in the reserve and then print new Celo dollars and pay out in dollars. The two are equivalent. And in fact, from a validator's perspective, if they would want one or the other, they can actually easily exchange between the two on-chain using that decentralized exchange I mentioned earlier. I think the other thing that I thought was interesting is that, and please correct me if I get this wrong, but basically if you're a staker, so if you, like a normal token holder who wants to stake in the system, you can kind of like nominate a validator and if a validator gets enough nomination, then they are in the active set. And so they can earn these seller dollars. And me as a staker, I earn these seller gold, but it's kind of independent of, you know, this, the validator doesn't take a commission of that. Exactly. So there's no commission. The validator is guaranteed to be able to cover their costs through these validator payments. Now, if the validator is offline or is not able to kind of meet the required performance criteria, then the reward for the staker will go down. And so you have an incentive to vote for reliable validators. Okay. Or actually in the Celo protocol for validator groups, and we'll get into the difference between that and voting directly for validators. And so validators are measured based on their ability to block produce, to endorse other blocks, and also their ability to collect other endorsements from other validators. And all of this is weighted by a correlation factor. So if they fail to do this while others are are also struggling to do this, then that affects the future reward schedule in a way that's more dramatic than if they do this at a time when no one else is affected. And so there's a strong built-in incentive to not run validators on shared infrastructure. 
because if there's a big outage that affects multiple validators and validators and the stakers who are voting for those validators will be disproportionately affected by that. Okay, that's great that you guys are implementing that. I know this has been discussed often also in Cosmos case. I think there's like various intentions, but it's not there yet. So I think that's great that you guys have that. So now you mentioned validated groups. What's the function of validated groups? So here I think is is one place where we're perhaps more different than other proof of stake protocols out there. So validator groups are analogous to parties in representative democracies. And the reason we, we introduced them is because it's really hard to know which validator to vote for, especially as the network matures and as there's more users who would like to participate in securing the network, but who don't really have a strong understanding of how proof of stake blockchains work, it becomes really hard for them to make educated decisions about which validators to vote for. And so validator groups here help by adding this extra level of indirection. They play a role where they can market for these validators, and they also have a responsibility to audit the validators and use their brand weight to provide a seal of approval for the validators that they include in their group. And then we use the Hans method to allocate validators based on the votes that come in for the individual validator groups. And so the Hans method is a technique that's frequently used by parliaments to pick seats based on party votes. I think a similar method was once used to achieve a proportional distribution of seats in the U.S. House of Representatives for a while. And this is really nice because it gives you proportional representation. I heard earlier on your podcast, you had Alfonso from Polkadot talking about the importance of proportional representation. I think we agree strongly with him and and generally Polkadot. And we wanted our uh, proof of stake protocol to have that feature as well. Because also, of course, one of the things that some might bring up is that if I have this flat amount that I earn as a validator, there's this temptation to say, oh, I'm going to, you know, we're going to run course one, course two, course three. There are no explicit things preventing that. Presumably, it's, it's just that it's kind of against the spirit of the protocol. So you think people won't endorse that? Actually, we don't discourage that. So I think similar to Polkadot, we expect the validators will run multiple validator instances. And we think that this is just a natural outcome of having a network where every validator on the network has the same voting weight. And so similar to Polkadot, we want every validator to have the same validator weight on the network. And I think unlike Polkadot, we actually enforce that right in the voting algorithm, whereas they use an economic incentive model to try to achieve that. And so this means that every validator running the PBFT protocol has the same weight. And so if you have more voting power, then you will have to run multiple validators in order to effectively get voted in using that voting power. And we think that's totally fine. The important thing here is that validators are running those validator nodes on different infrastructure, and that is encouraged through economic incentives around those penalties when there are outages, again, based on those correlation factors. Okay, okay. So let's come back to this validator group thing. Now... I understand the argument for it. Actually, Felix from our team, he's been writing a blog that I think is going to be published uh, probably before this comes out. So I think it should be published where he looked at the Cosmos network and he looked at all of the, basically some data analysis on all of the delegators to see how many delegators, for example, delegate to more than one validator. And, you know, there's some patterns there in particular that basically the small delegators for the most part, just delegate to one validator, and it tends to be sort of a cheap validator, right? So it's one low-cost validator, whereas larger delegators tend to split more up. But I think the average was that each delegator delegated only to 1.7 validators. So you see, for example, that there's not a lot of people kind of diversifying and distributing their stake across many validators, So I can see that validated groups would be a way to address that. At the same time, are you worried about like a centralization in that maybe there's in the end two or three such large validator groups and they in the end have a tremendous amount of control over the network? Yes. And so we built in mechanisms to prevent that from happening, because I think if that were to happen, it would be, I think, not a great end state. And so validator groups have maximum sizes that they can have. So... We're aiming to have around 
a maximum of 10 to 20 validator groups that can ever exist and, and hopefully much more based on enforcing this maximum. And so once a validator group reaches a certain size, you cannot vote for it anymore. Okay. So I presume you meant minimum of 10 to 20 validator groups, not maximum. You're right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. And so I guess, you, yeah, you'll have these, these validator groups that kind of will do this marketing, maybe uh, sort of verify each other's setups. Maybe they're companies that know and trust each other, maybe build some sort of shared brand. Yeah, it's very interesting. Exactly. I think we envision a world where validator groups get good at using their brand to go and audit existing validators. You know, validator groups will probably be good at marketing and validators themselves can focus on what they're good at, which is doing really good OPSEC and not having to worry so much about marketing. I think in a world, especially where there's a lot of competition from validators and commissions keep kind of getting pushed down and down, there's really strong forces that push validators to go out and try to build a name for themselves and, you know, this may or may not be part of their core competency. You know, I think what makes a good validator is being someone who's trustworthy, who has applied really great OPSEC and can really effectively secure a network. And we want those validators to continue to focus on that and have validator groups take over these other aspects of running and reaching out to the community and, and convincing the community that they've done a good job auditing their validators that they should be voted for. Interesting. So presumably you might also see that the validators pay like a membership fee to the group for like doing some of these things like security audit, marketing and things like that. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. And that's actually already built into the protocol. Okay. Okay. Now you talked about them being sort of analogous to parties in a democracy. Do you think the validator groups will also have a role in governance or what's the relationship between validation and governance? It's a very good question. For now, there is no direct relationship, but I think as the protocol matures and they become more complicated and difficult to understand the governance proposals, then I think they can potentially play a role. So right now, the way that the protocol works is we have full on-chain governance, and in order to earn staking rewards, you actually also need to participate in governance. And it's sufficient to abstain from votes, but at least it's important to be able to vote. And you can delegate that vote to someone else, and so you could potentially delegate it to your validator group, or you could delegate it to a different entity or group of people, and we'll see how that plays out after we, we launch the network. But it is important to participate in governance uh, if you want to receive those rewards. A uh, final thing when it comes to this rewards thing, I saw that there's also, when it talked about block rewards, it also talked about ecosystem funding and grants. How does that work? A small percentage of the Epoch rewards gets placed in a smart contract that through governance can be used uh, effectively as a community fund to help fund development. And so, you know, I think other protocols are doing this as well. And, and we think it's a good idea to have some funds available for the community through governance to help distribute for kind of future development to help basically invest in the protocol. One, I think, interesting place, too, where, where Celo, I think, starts to diverge from what other proof of stake networks are doing is to make the reward for staking be tied to how long you lock up your Celo gold. And so I think this is being discussed also in Polkadot, and it has been discussed in the past as well. And I think, you know, from an incentive perspective, especially if there's a community fund that people can vote for, we want to incentivize people to lock up their gold for a while if they're participating in governance and also if they're participating in, in voting for validators. And so your vote that you get when voting for validator groups and when voting for governance proposals is actually weighted by how long you lock up your gold for. And I think critically, it's not quite how long you lock it up because that has other interesting effects where, say, if you locked it up for a long time, then maybe you'd have more voting power. But towards the end of that period, you would no longer have an incentive to vote for the long-term success of the network, yet you would still have the higher voting power. So instead, Celo uses what's called a notice period. And so you agree to a notice period when you lock up your Celo gold. That is the period of time that it will take you to withdraw your funds once you're done staking, once you're done locking up your, your gold. And so if you agree to wait six months after you're done staking, then you'll have less of a 
voting weight than if you agree to wait one year, for example, after you've done a staking. And so this is, is nice because throughout any point in time, while you're voting, you still have the same incentive to vote for the long-term success of the protocol if you've agreed to a longer notice period. Yeah, although I guess that ties very much into a whole or a delegation voucher stuff, you know, which because in the end, it's always possible for a centralized party to circumvent all of these things. And so I think it's a little bit of a trade-off whether you want to try to build these things into the protocol or whether one wants to basically give people the ability to have liquidity, which I think makes it easier to build stuff in a decentralized way. But I think that's that's a whole other big discussion. So It's a very interesting topic and we're you know, eagerly watching what's going on with other networks to see how this unfolds. Yeah. You wanted to talk a little bit more detail maybe before we wrap up about Light client thing? Sure, yeah. So I, I mentioned that Celo's PBFT based proof of stake protocol it has some similarities to existing uh, proof of stake protocols, but I think there's one big difference that we're particularly proud of that I think really ties into this kind of mobile first approach that we're taking. And that's that the protocol was designed to have a very efficient light client sync. And so this means that if you're using the Celo mobile wallet, you can connect to the protocol connected to the network and quickly sync and get the latest Merkle root commitment to be able to query full nodes to fetch state from the network and then verify that state using those Merkle proofs. To do that really quickly, we built on existing work by you know, many of the other protocols. So obviously Bitcoin and Ethereum have done a lot in this regard. But if you want to get the latest Merkle root commitment with, say, Ethereum, you'd have to sync every header from the beginning of the launch of Ethereum. And that's a lot of data, especially if you have a very short block period. And so Celo addresses this in three ways. Uh, number one, it uses uh, something we call epoch-based syncing under the protocol. Um, and this is not new. Others have done this before as well. Elections can only happen for validators at the end of each epoch, which means, in our case, epochs are roughly one day. And so the validator set changes can only happen once per day. And so as a light client, you only have to sync the headers where those validator set changes happen. So you only have to download one header per day. And for our network, that's a 17,000 times reduction in the number of headers you have to download. So that's pretty great. And then the second thing that we do is use BLS signatures to aggregate all of the signatures that each of the validator is providing for the PBFT protocol so that in each header, we only need one aggregated signature. This gives us another 90% reduction in, in storage. Uh, it also makes it much easier for us to scale our validator set beyond 100 validators, because doing so doesn't increase the size of the header or really the size of the chain. And then finally, and this is probably the most interesting and novel aspect of what we're doing, we're actually using a new curve called BLS12377 for running these BLS signatures. And this curve was discovered fairly recently, and it was discovered because it can be efficiently executed in a uh, recursive SNARK, which is really, really useful for our purposes. And so we can actually run this like client protocol that I just described of downloading the last header of each epoch and checking the signatures of those headers. We can actually run that inside our R1CS circuit and use that to construct a proof that verifies that the current header is in fact part of the chain. And so as a light client, if you connect to a full node, you can get a succinct ZK snark based proof back or a number of small proofs that are each roughly 600 bytes in size. You can get that back and you can with very, very high confidence know that, that the header that the full node is sending you is in fact part of the chain and likely the latest header. And so this allows you to really quickly sync with the network and allows us to build a mobile wallet that is very efficient from a data utilization perspective, but still remains censorship resistant and fully permissionless. Cool. That's very cool. That makes a lot of sense. And that's well described so that even as a mostly non-technical or semi-technical person, I, I can follow. So that's fantastic. One final thing related to this is around full nodes. So each of these light clients that are being serviced by these full nodes obviously have to do some work. And in a traditional network, most of the time, there isn't really enough incentive for these full nodes to want to service like clients. And so one thing that Celo has done is added uh, full node incentives that basically allow you to earn crypto assets simply by running a full node to help service these like clients. 
And the way it works is if a like client performs a transaction, they include the address of this full node in that transaction when they sign it. And the full node only forwards that transaction if it has the address in the transaction. And then the transaction fee gets split between the validators and the full node that serviced that like client. As a full node, you can just spin up a node and actually start earning crypto assets without having previously needed to buy some of the asset. And so this is obviously a frequent criticism of proof of stake networks that you have to buy some of the asset to stake before you can actually participate in the protocol. And we wanted to bring back some of the features that we really liked in proof of work networks, like the ability to just spin up some software and start having it power the network and start earning crypto assets in return. And we can do that with this full node incentive mechanism. Cool. So you mentioned launch is planned for end of this year, early next year. If people want to learn more, get involved, where can they go? If you're interested in seeing some documentation for how to run a validator node or how to run one of these full nodes, then we have very detailed instructions on docs.cello.org. If you're interested in checking out the source code, then you, know, you can see it at uh, everything is open source. Uh, it's available at github.com slash cello-org. And of course, our, our homepage is just cello.org. And we have a lot of material and lots of links to our community Discord and uh, our forums and, and other places that might be of interest to you. Cool. Well, with that, thanks so much, Mark. It was a pleasure having you on. I'm really excited about Cello, uh, what you guys are going to ship and uh, how it's actually going to be used in the end by, by real people. So thanks so much. Thank you, Brian. It was really great uh, being here. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Chorus One podcast. Visit chorus.one for more information about our work. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to stay tuned on new episodes airing every Monday.